productivity solutions that are particularly well suited for globally distributed development teams. Artworks, 1,500 plus employees operate out of 17 offices located in seven different countries. Our client range from small startups to multinational corporations with the common thread being the fact that ThoughtWorks is often asked to work on business critical solutions that differentiate our clients in the marketplace. I now invite our presenters, Mr. Scott and Mr. Rajesh, to introduce themselves. Scott? Thanks, Gavin. Hi. Um, so my name is Scott Shaw. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I've been working in the IT industry for the last dozen years or so, and before that I have a background in applied research uh, algorithms and high-performance computing. So last year I've been the general manager of ThoughtWorks Pune Development Center. Uh, Pune, we have about 150 professional service staff in Pune, um, and we do serving a variety of customers. Um, before that, I've had a variety of roles in ThoughtWorks Australia, both in general management and as a developer and architect. Uh, despite my American accent, I do call Australia my permanent home. I've lived there for several years before I came to India. Um, so in my management role as followers, I've had the opportunity to see a really broad variety of distributed agile projects at work, agile projects of all kinds, really. And it's given me a pretty good vantage point to see what works and what doesn't. Uh, and I'd like to share some of those uh, observations and experiences with you today. Uh, now, if Rajesh would introduce himself. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Rajesh and I'm an architect and ThoughtWorks. Uh, for the past two years, uh, I've been working on uh, one of the largest uh, agile distributed agile projects at, uh, at ThoughtWorks. And uh, at now, as, as an architect on the systems team, uh, I'm helping ThoughtWorks build uh, the infrastructure for uh, delivering uh, customer projects. So with that introduction, uh, back to you, Scott. Yeah, so we'd like to spend some time today focusing specifically on the technical aspects of distributed agile problem. I know many people would say that distributed agile is something of an oxymoron, um, but the fact is we've been successfully delivering these projects uh, at Ballworks for nearly 10 years now and learned a few things over the years. Uh, and one of the things we've learned is that you can't really ignore the engineering aspect of the problem when you're uh, taking an agile project overseas. So we'll begin today by setting the stage a little and describing the motivation for distributing an agile project in the first place and what the right motivation is. And then we'll describe some of the technical questions you have to answer while you go through the process of setting up the project. And uh, finally, we'll close by going through a couple of case studies. They're contrasting studies. The first one is a, uh, a relatively small project done entirely from offshore using very lightweight technology and a high level of trust and collaboration between the offshore and offshore teams. And the second one is a very is a large project uh, involving a large legacy code base that went through an evolution from sort of a medium-sized project to a very large project over time. So going on to the next slide, let's uh, set the stage. And what I'd like you to do is put yourself in place of many of the customers that I deal with. In fact, some of you probably already fit this description. Um, so imagine you're a development manager for an online commerce company. Um, you're someone who's managed to build a reputation with your business partners for delivering what you say you're going to deliver. And you do this on time and with high quality. You release frequently in the production, and your business partners know they can request a feature and have it turned around in a matter of days. And the way you're able to do this is because you have a team of, say, 10 or so talented people, very talented people who like to work very closely with each other. They work in tight iterations. They have frequent discussions with the product managers and the business owners to understand the product vision and offer some suggested improvements as well. Furthermore, they're constantly striving for the highest technical quality, constantly looking for ways to simplify and improve the design of their software. In other words, you've got a small, smoothly functioning, agile team that you can rely on. But now you face a dilemma. Uh, the business has set a date and a target for delivery of the system that exceeds the current capacity of your team. And you've looked at all the options and decided that uh, your only choice in to be able to meet these delivery commitments is to scale the team up from 10 to say 20 or 30 or more. So now's a good time to kind of point out a statistic. Uh, a friend of mine recently ran some statistics on seek.com uh, on job ads. And it turns out since the 1st of June 2010, which isn't that long ago, there have been 1,100 job listings that mention Agile someplace. 
Um, so what, what this boils down to is something you're probably already aware of, and that is that there is a shortage of, of these sorts of skills. If you have a team of 10 people that are really highly skilled and know how to deliver Agile now, then you're probably pretty lucky. Other people are probably trying to hire them away from you. So the chances of you doubling, tripling, quadrupling the size of your team in a short period of time in the same city and keeping the quality and the level of service the same is pretty slim. So you probably have no choice in this situation uh, but to distribute the project. Either you have to distribute it to another city or even to another continent. And this is the choice that many of our customers are, trying, are making right now. So what do you need to do? Assuming this is the case and you want to go ahead with it, what do you need to do to ensure success? So there's no escaping the fact, and you have to remember this, that distributing agile is hard. Um, but on the other hand, all large distributed projects are hard. And it turns out that the transparency and the quality assurance that you get with Agile are exactly the antidotes to the risks that we experience on large distributed projects. So I think the question is what else are you going to do? Agile still, although uh, this situation is not necessarily textbook Agile, um, it's using these techniques of constant communication, feedback, short iteration, uh, high attention to quality uh, are the way to manage the risk on these projects. So when you're contemplating expanding an agile project offshore or just to another city, you, you kind of need to take a holistic approach. And I put in this diagram, tried to put all that together. So the first thing is that communication is the thing that ties everything together. Um, adequate communication can only take place when you have the right relationships in place, uh, when all the parties are deeply engaged. So that means traveling frequently, having formal communication plans, taking the time to build relationships, and uh, providing opportunities for informal interaction between the team. So many of the technical developments we'll be talking about today are, are ways to work around some of the barriers to communication that arise on a distributed project. Now, in addition to that, you need to have the right processes and you need to have the right people in place. And we could devote entire talks to each of these subjects. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about it some more later if you want to get in touch with me. Um, you need to have the best people, obviously, uh, but preferably ones that have experience in this area. And you need to be somewhat more formal about your processes in a distributed project than you do when the team is entirely co-located. But finally, those considerations aren't a uh, enough by themselves to ensure success. The technology considerations also have an enormous impact on the success of the project. And I think too many teams try to implement Scrum, uh, the process uh, of Scrum, without paying attention to the engineering practices, only to fail with their Agile project. Doesn't matter if you're co-located or distributed. Um, these people decide Agile doesn't work, but the fact is they, they only went part way into the problem and they didn't address the technical aspect. So here are some of the topics we'll be considering today. Um, first, of course, we need to talk about the team structure and, and technical leadership, uh, team structure around the technology. We'll then move on to discuss the source control and continuous integration needs for a distributed team, and then uh, talk about how you might configure your developer machines uh, for a large team split across geography, just in unique situations that arise there. We'll then move on to talk about the infrastructure needed the hardware, network, and communication systems to support these practices. And then we'll uh, talk about some architectural considerations, how that affects the distributed project, and finally, how do you deploy software that's developed in one location into servers that are hosted in another location. Uh, so during this talk, I'm going to assume you're familiar with Agile Basics. Uh, it's not an introductory Agile talk. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow along if you don't have any Agile experience. Uh, but things such as test-driven development, pair programming, continuous integration, refactoring, automated functional tests, all these things still apply in the distributed sense. And, and in most cases, they probably become more important than they were before. So let's, uh, let's dive in and first of all uh, talk about the team structure. So one of, this is one of the first things you need to consider when you're ramping up and starting a, a, a distributed agile project. Um, 
So you need to think about what expertise do you need and, and where you can get the people and where you're going to place them. So you might be lucky and have a team that doesn't need a strong technical leader. And then there are some high-performing agile teams that can rotate the tech lead uh, responsibilities around the team pretty efficiently. However, if you're in a typical situation on a largest project where there's kind of a steady rotation of people going through the project, then you probably need to ensure a certain level of continuity and leadership. Now, one simple pattern is to have a single tech lead spread across multiple locations, as like shown in the upper left-hand corner here. In this situation, it can work, but you really need to watch out for churn. So it can happen that uh, the team in one location decides to go off in, in really in a matter of uh, day or hours in a different direction, and then they, they end up redoing work that was done by a team in a different time zone the previous night. So if you're going with this pattern, it's really important to have the tech lead rotating through all the locations. Um, we found that when you have a decent sized team, say, you know, 20 people offshore, uh, a technical person onshore can be kept busy nearly full time. This is even when there aren't technical people or technical tasks necessarily, necessarily onshore. Um, but that person can be kept busy full time just communicating, just answering questions, explaining the ramifications of their decisions to, to the business stakeholders and also explaining and the, the, the decisions that have been made back to the team offshore. It's a really important position. So it's important, the tech lead is the best person to have in that role, but it can, uh, it's also good to rotate different people through it. So the next pattern uh, that you might want to consider, though, uh, to, and it's a bit more effective, is to have uh, technical leaders in each location. So. Uh, this would be a, a tech lead in the offshore and tech, technical person in the onshore team. Um, it's really important for these people to communicate frequently and to have a really close working relationship. So um, they need to maintain that shared vision, shared vision that goes across um, all of the locations and all the teams. So you can might want to consider having you know a, a regular daily uh, cross-site tech huddle where these that these people lead and are always present for. Um, uh, it, this is part of the more formal communication plan that you need to put in place. So another pattern we found useful is, especially when teams grow larger, is to assign um, feature owners within each team. So these are individuals from within the team that take end-to-end -end responsibility for a given feature. That's all the way from the requirements, understanding requirements, to the deployment of that feature into production. And by feature here, I mean something that spans multiple user stories and represents a deployable piece of functionality. This is bigger than user story. So um, although the pairs working on this feature, I want to stress, will still rotate. So it's really important, again, to prevent silos of information from happening. But it is good to have a single person. We found it useful to have a single person that sort of anchors that feature from beginning to end. Now, if the project's large enough, finally, you're going to have to address the problem is the project is probably, probably large enough to say that you've got multiple teams working simultaneously on the same code base. You're going to have to confront the decision of how to partition the work between the teams. Mm -hmm. uh, the choices are basically you partition vertically so that um, each team is working on a feature from all the way from the view layer down to the back end services, or horizontally, where a team gets responsibility for a particular layer of the application, say, the, the, just the view layer or just the services layer. The vertical approach uh, means that the team is going to implement functionality all the way from the top to the bottom, and it's probably the approach that we would recommend and that, that we would prefer under most circumstances. Of course, it's not practical necessarily in every situation, so you kind of have to tailor this to the application and to the situation at hand. Um, Sometimes you'll have to see some horizontal partition, particularly if you're developing services, uh, you know, a standalone service layer uh, that we'll get into later as an uh, arch architectural recommendation. That, um, in that case, you may have multiple consumer teams working against the same service, so it's useful to have a team taking responsibility for the service. But finally, I, I want to stress that it's important to have the technical leader present with the team from the very start. Uh, we usually kick projects off with a, an inception phase, that's a series of workshops to, the, uh, to kind of develop a shared understanding between all the parties of what's going to be built. Um, and there's a temptation to put non-technical people into those workshops, say a, a business analyst, project manager, and so on, and because it's you know, expensive to, to make, have people travel. Usually it's somebody traveling offshore. Um, but that's a mistake. It's really important to have the technical person 
involved or set the vision to understand the, the ramifications and communicate those things back to the business so they can make the right decisions. And that usually means uh, sending the tech lead offshore, onshore for the initial weeks of the project. So uh, fun, uh, next topic is source control. So uh, generally we've seen an evolution of source control systems and so this has changed rapidly in the last couple of years. And it's one of the things that can either make life difficult or make life extremely painful for a distributed team. So once upon a time, all we had was uh, CVS uh, or SVN with a single master repository. But um, the version has improved on this somewhat because it gives you the opportunity to have master-slave replication between one or more subversion repositories. Um, so that means the team, the, the really time-consuming, painful activity is pulling the entire code base from a server located in one continent to a developer's workstation located in another continent. This would be very slow sometimes with the version. So the master slave uh, gives you the opportunity to replicate those things um, when you know, over time and then have the code available for people to pull out of locally. But commits still need to be made potentially to the master repository in another location. But recently, this field has been greatly influenced by the way people do open source software delivery. And in some ways, we can look at the Linux kernel as kind of a model of how to run a large-scale distributed project. So it's not really a coincidence that Git, which is the source control system used for, for Linux, is, is now finding very uh, wide acceptance in custom app tests and in enterprises. Now, Git helps in at least two ways. First of all, it's just faster to retrieve the code over the network because of the way Git compresses and, and stores changes. Uh, pulling the complete code base from one location to another is like orders of magnitude faster than, than with subversion. The other thing is that it allows people to do branching and merging in a much easier way than, than the traditional source code uh, management systems. So it's possible for teams to branch, share changes locally, and develop safely even when the build is broken, and then commit those changes later on to a master repository. So eventually, uh, we're going to see teams more and more using complete uh, distributed uh, setups, whether it's Git or Material, and probably um, deploying Git on the cloud. So GitHub is becoming a, a very popular, really pushing the popularity of Git and becoming the preferred way to, um, to manage source control over a distributed network. Um, so the next topic I'd like to discuss is continuous integration. So continuous integration is always important on an agile project, but in a distributed setting, it becomes really the number one enabler. It's the main communication mechanism. The most immediate communication tells people whether they're doing the right thing or not. If we don't have continuous integration, it's for teams working independently to kind of go off in the wrong direction. And it brings, takes a lot of rework to bring them back together. But CI provides the immediate feedback to all the teams that they've done the wrong thing and need to stop and review where they're going. But actually, continuous integration is just one step of the build process, really. And we really want, what we want to do is look at the entire um, life cycle from, from developing code on the, workers, on the de developer's workstation to deploying that code into production. And there's multiple steps along that way, build, unit test, mode test, regression test, UAT, deployment of the staging, the point of production. And although each of these steps is independent, they all depend on the previous steps and feed into the steps downstream. And it really is a pipeline of activities. But it's, such a, it's really tempting to take sort of a throw it over the wall mentality in each step. So I'm sure we've all seen projects like that where you know the developer team throws the code over to the UAT team and basically forgets about it and there's no communication or handoff there. So this risk becomes even greater in a distributed situation. So you really need to pay attention to maintaining the communication and continuity across that whole pipeline by viewing it as a pipeline, a continuous business process, and managing it that way. So we typically use a, cruise like, a, a tool like Cruise, which is a Dalek Studios product. It's now called Go uh, to manage these pipelines. Of course, it's possible to track it with a card wall. There's no reason you have to have a tool to do that. But it just makes life a lot easier, and it makes things much more visible and immediate across different geographies. 
What I'm showing here is a panel from Cruz for one of our projects. You can see there's a, there's a each of these uh, white boxes encompasses a pipeline. So um, there's uh, the, the main pipeline is the build and unit test, then on functional tests, which happen to be broken in this case. Um, then there's a manual step that deploys TUAT, and then there's another uh, deploying into a um, uh, production-like environment. Um, so these Pipelines can be combined and um, parallelized, and the tool kind of helps bring them all together, as well as managing the, the parallel execution of various build tasks across a, a cloud of agents. And one of the unavoidable consequences here that continues that, uh, is that the, this is sort of a location kind of process, and it's really important to, to make sure that you've got enough uh, compute horsepower in the location where your build is going to take place, where your continuous integration is going to be hosted. Also enough network bandwidth to um, host all the changes and, and integration points that have to be fanned out from there. Um, so it is possible to speed things up with parallelization, but there's no avoiding the fact that you need plenty of CPU capacity to be able to uh, run all of these tests and, and uh, that you would eventually have for a very large system. The next uh, the topic, before I hand it over to Rajesh, is, is the subject of developer environments. So one of the things we need to deal with on every project, but it, it becomes more complex on these large distributed projects, is the task of setting up individual developers on their workstation. Um, the goal should be for the developer to be able to run unit tests in, a, in an environment that simulates an actual production environment, uh, complete with all the integration points and the network considerations and so on. For an onshore project, we can sometimes get away with piggybacking off, you know, state aging systems or test, test environments uh, so that we don't, uh, in, we don't, however, have that luxury in an offshore environment. We usually need to simulate those environments um, in the developer's workstation um, with host files, DNS, writing table, and so on. And sometimes setting these up can be quite complex. Um, furthermore, as the team scales up, you know, you have to do this more and more frequently. So it pays to have a way to do it in a repeatable uh, efficient manner. So to address this, we've experimented with a lot of different virtualized environments for developers to work in. Um, but unfortunately, even the lightest weight virtualization, even um, uh, OpenVZ, if you're familiar with that, it, OpenVZ is a container that delegates most of its work to the to the host operating system. So it's very thin layers. Even that imposes some constraints and, and inefficiencies and complications that um, you don't have to work with in a, in a host environment. So one thing that we've hit on is actually an old solution that's been very useful for us, and that is using the BSD ch root command. So these are called jails. So I don't know if you may be familiar with them, but um, the ch root command allows you to transfer a running process into a completely new root environment. So, so we can set up a root environment for each developer, and that and then shear root into that, and that gives them an isolated environment that they can work in. It's a private sandbox that simulates all of the, the uh, connections and, and networking of uh, production environment, but belongs just to that one user. And it's really easy to replicate these. We can scrap them, start over from scratch. Um, and also, it's a really good way to push out changes to the production environment to the rest of the team. Now, typically, what happens is the developers run an IDE locally on their workstation write code to a shared drive, and then log in remotely into these uh, Cheroot jails that are hosted on a Blade server, and then they can run their build and test on those uh, on, on that remote environment uh, from the code that they've been developing in their workstation. So to support all this, we need to have a good infrastructure. So it's a, it's a really uh, major consideration having the right networking and, and hardware in place. So I'd like to uh, ask Rajesh to address that. Thanks, Scott. So as, as uh, Scott mentioned, uh, we, we went through continuous integration, uh, how you do that, how you do your builds, and uh, how you do, you know, how the developer environment would be set up to support a distributed agile project. So it is uh, critical to understand that it's really essential to have a sound infrastructure in place. Uh, So, 
doing this exercise up early, the planning exercise up early, uh, kind of gives you a view of uh, how how the infrastructure that you need to put in place is going to impact uh, your cost of uh, cost of delivery. So, as a CXO or your pro or a program manager or a delivery manager, you really need to understand how this reflects on the cost of delivery. So. What some of the challenges that we've uh, we've come across uh, in offshore delivery and uh, and the way we've solved them, we've, uh, some of them uh, have been kind of uh, kind of sprung up as surprises, and uh, we've learned over time to kind of plan for this. So some of the things that you probably want to consider and uh, uh, Scott touched upon is what kind of a bandwidth do you need to be able to support your offshore delivery? Uh, what kind of a connectivity do you need to? Uh, to allow for communication between between your different different locations, uh, whether this is a uh, whether this is a, a VPN over an over an IPsec VPN over the internet, or whether you require uh, lease circuits or NTLS lines between your uh, between your uh, different locations. The other thing that you need to worry about is uh, how do you how do you build security into 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 all of this? Uh, obviously, you want to keep your source code safe. You want to keep your uh, source code confidential. Uh, you want to uh, be able to expose uh, your different environments, for example, your UATs and your test environments to your stakeholders. Uh, but at the same time, make sure that that happens uh, happens securely. So, uh, you well. So some things that you need to consider is how your VPNs are structured, whether these are point-to-point -point IPsec VPNs, uh, if you need to have a strong network architecture in place at different locations, creating DNGs for hosting your different environments so that they can be accessed, uh, accessed across uh, across these locations. So these are some of the questions uh, that that you uh, probably need to uh, probably need to understand. Um, on the other hand, uh, like uh, what Scott mentioned again was uh, the, the requirement for computing resources to be able to deliver your project. So if you've got large bills, uh, how do you how do you support large bills? Uh, what what kind of a computing horsepower do you need to support uh, support large bills? Uh, we've used uh, virtualization, uh, so you have a lot of options out, out there. Uh, whether this is uh, setting up your own build grids or your build infrastructure, or whether it is virtualizing your environment to to help support uh, support delivery, or where you want to, uh, there are a lot of different uh, storage and and uh, cloud offerings out there that help you do this uh, completely. Outsource this to a third party where where you just focus on on uh, your core business and your core uh, activities for for development. So with that, uh, it's back to you, Scott. Okay, I'd now like to discuss some of the architectural considerations that you're going to need to make uh, for distributed projects. Um, this is one of the hurdles we we most frequently encounter in taking a project that was working well onshore and distributing it. And what you'll likely find is that the monolithic app, monolithic type architecture that worked well for a co-located agile team is probably not going to work as well for a distributed team. So. Um, the monolithic design is probably the right thing to do for you. It's usually the simplest thing possible, and when you can, when the team can work in one place on a single code base, uh, they can run tests against the entire system every time they check in. Then um, that that's really the right thing to do. But when you're moving to a larger distributed team, it's often necessary for teams to work independently on different parts of the system. So what I've drawn here is, is a typical. Uh, layered architecture. You've seen this diagram many times, I'm sure, showing decoupling but, and also possible physical separation between the consumer components, uh, the services, and the view layer. Notice that the, in this situation, the services are completely decoupled. What I tried to show is that the domain objects, even that the services rely on, are completely contained within those, uh, within those services. Um, now, what this means is that there's a chance that there might be some duplication of domain objects between services. Now, this is this is a heretical idea to those of us who've been doing agile for a long time. The idea that you would, in some cases, repeat yourself uh, in the code base. Now, we usually try to avoid this at all costs. But what we found is that there are some benefits to this, and that if you do a good job of designing your services, that is, services that are focused on business processes that. Um, kind of have their own 
uh, the ownership over the data for which they're responsible and that are highly decoupled uh, from each other, then there's the chance of duplication of domain objects is, uh, is pretty low. And then this next slide illustrates why we want to, we want to go this way. Uh, the benefit of this architecture of independent services and components is that teams can work in different parts of the system independently without interfering with each other. A team in India can work on a vertical slice of functionality, let's say the payment process, and deal with both the consumer components uh, of that payment process and the services and the domain objects relevant to the payment process. They can develop tests that run tests just against that service and then commit those changes to the master code base. At the same time, uh, an Australian team, say, may be working on, on a booking process that, um, in a similar independent fashion. When they check these things into the master repository, then there is another set of continuous integration tests that get run. So smoke tests, regression tests, these are longer, heavier weight uh, tests, uh, possibly UAT, and so on. So there is, there is continuous integration that happens across the entire system, but it pays to be able to, to have these people working in parallel, being able to test their changes in parallel. Um, but, and of course, it means you need to have the right kind of source control. Uh, so goes, that goes back to what we were saying about source control, continuous integration. These things are, are also factors that, that uh, contribute to support to working in, in this way. Uh, final, the final stage you're going to have to worry about uh, is deployment. So there's some challenges in deploying to um, uh, servers in another continent, and I'll let Rajesh discuss that. Right. So. Uh, Let's, let's uh, touch on deployment for, for a while. And uh, what, what's really changed over the last last few years or last decade or over the last deployment scenario that we uh, that we encounter today? Um, we no longer have uh, deployment scenarios which are which are simple. Uh, typically, the deployment scenarios involve uh, pushing your pushing your final binaries to multiple servers uh, across uh, across networks. Uh, all these uh, binaries, if you have if you have distributed your application across different layers, uh, that means these binaries also go into different locations on different servers. So all this all this has kind of kind of made made deployment a really uh, a huge challenge. Even on a typical agile project, one one thing that is that is pretty evident, and what you what I frequently notice is that you have developers that who build your software uh, in the fastest possible manner. And, uh, and, and 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 in an agile man, uh, manner. And when it comes to the point of deployment, what we seem to get into what is suspiciously, suspiciously what looks like a waterfall model. That means you've got after a few weeks of development, you've got to go through several old weeks through change management and change control until your binary see the light of the day. So. What what what's the reason for this? One one of the reasons I uh, which I which I call is is the uh, development operations divide, and there are some reasons why why this uh, development operations divide happens. Uh, one thing you need to understand is uh, when your application is working in production, and somebody needs to fix a problem, the guy who's fixing the problem or the guy with the pager who's answering the call is not the guy who necessarily wrote the code. And that's a big challenge uh, because this, this guy now needs to figure out uh, how the, how your application needs to be fixed when it's uh, when it's uh, out there in the uh, out there in production. There are a couple of things uh, that can overcome this challenge that can add, uh, that can help address this uh, DevOps divide, so to speak. And I will quickly touch on uh, touch on a few points that you know uh, these are not all of them, uh, but just a few of them uh, because this topic itself mandates a separate discussion. So let me talk about a few of them. Uh, one of the scenarios uh, that we need to consider is uh, is the phenomenon of configuration drift. Configuration drift is uh, when you got a complex deployment scenario, uh, you got you are pushing different configurations to different servers, whether it's uh, your uh, for a web-based application it would be your internet information services, or your or Apache web servers, or different application layers that uh, servers at different layers. Uh, typically, in in scenarios like these, uh, what happens is the configuration from different servers seems to change on its own accord. It seems to have life of its own, and what ends up is you end up with 
performance issues, you end up with uh, uh, application issues that are difficult to diagnose, difficult to pinpoint, and and, uh, and difficult to test. One way to avoid avoid the phenomenon of configuration drift is to test your configuration. So I, I, I like to call this uh, test-driven deployment. Uh, though uh, you know there's, there's a far far reaching uh, meaning to to uh, test-driven deployment. Uh, the idea is to be able to segregate your configurations into an environment configuration versus uh, your application configuration and then be able to write tests around those. It's really cheap to write those tests. It's quite easy to write those tests and uh, it's easy to run those tests just before you do a deployment. That they give you a, they give you a, a fair visibility into whether your configuration has changed or not. Also, it, it also kind of puts a, puts a check on uh, how the configuration has changed. Change. So every time someone needs to go and change something in your configuration, uh, you first need to go and uh, change your test. So that kind of uh, creates a safety harness to prevent uh, configuration drift. The other thing to consider is uh, automate, your, automate the deployment of your configuration as well. Uh, in the open source world, there are different tools available to do that. Uh, in the Microsoft world, or uh, some of the other tools, you may not have these tool sets, but uh, you can always write scripts to be able to do that. Uh, one of the tools that is popular here at uh, ThoughtWorks for most of our open source, and in fact, uh, almost all of our internal systems is uh, called Puppet. It helps us uh, actually get a configuration from a source control repository and push it into push it to you know, wide uh, array of servers, uh, servers out, out there on the, on the internet. The other bit about uh, about what you need to do is, uh, and how, how you can avoid a lot of complexity in deployment, is uh, the use of one-touch or one-click uh, one deployment. Um, one-touch, one-click deployment really, really helps us reduce the time to uh, time where your production systems really need to be down, uh, cuts down your uh, cuts down the time to uh, time to deploy an application across different servers, across different layers of this, uh, across different layers. Um, one touch deployment really is a uh, what I think is a productivity tool, uh, a really important point to kind of bridge the DevOps gap uh, using uh, uh, using some clever clever mechanisms that when you can actually locate your uh, you know a mirror of your source control repository within the production environment. You could actually pick your code, build your code within a within a staging or a production like environment, and uh, which uh, and push it from there to production. So it really helps you to get across uh, firewalls uh, and and uh, network rules that prevent you from doing a simple uh, simple copy of your binary to your to your production or or uh, staging environment. One important point, point to note is uh, we've been talking about testing and creating safety harnesses for all of our processes. Uh, so if you're doing it in your continuous integration, if you're doing it for your functional tests, uh, there's no reason why you cannot do it for uh, deployment as well. So one thing to consider is how do you test your deployment scripts? Uh, how do you test your deployment? So uh, there are two ways. One is to actively uh, actively create your staging environments and need, and probe your staging environments once the deployment is completed. Uh, that means uh, testing the network ports, uh, testing whether services are available or on the right servers or not, uh, being able to do a quick sanity check across your different servers and to figure out uh, whether the application is working out there or not. Uh, creating probes for actually going and reading the configuration. So we have uh, so there are two sets available that that help you do that. Uh, on some of the uh, programs over here, we've also built our own tool sets. Uh, we call probes to to do a post deployment check to give us a uh, to tell us whether everything's okay or something's uh, you know some part of the deployment was not uh, not okay. Uh, some of the tools we uh, we commonly use in a Microsoft world it's a uh, com or the System Center uh, Ops Manager. Uh, in the open source world, we've got uh, tools like Nagios and uh, and a bunch of other tools that that help us uh, help us test our deployments and also help us uh, monitor our our production environments after deployment is done. So these are some things that you want to uh, want to look at uh, in deployment. Uh, uh, having these things in place uh, helps us to get us get to the next page where where is something what we want to go where we want to go with agile and that's uh, continuous deployment. So 
that's the deployment for you, uh, and Scott's going to take up the next uh, next uh, part of the presentation, which is the case study. Yeah. So um, there's a couple of case studies we'd like to go through now. Uh, the first is uh, we chose these because they're quite contrasting projects. The first is um, a project we did for the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust, which is a consortium of arts organizations in, in Pittsburgh in the U.S. And the second one is the Trainline.com, which um, was a very large project that spanned uh, several years and hundreds of people. So PCT um, is an arts consortium. So the idea is that the ballet, the theater, the symphony all came together in Pittsburgh to, um, to create a new website. Uh, they found, they uh, pooled their resources to create a single website where people can come and buy tickets, man subscriptions, accept donations, uh, publicize events, and so on. Um, and the, the rebuild of their website was to appeal to a younger sort of tech-savvy audience. Um, so this was, in some ways, it was a very standard website rebuild, but in other ways, it presented some technical challenges. So first of all, um, the Cultural Trust, along with most of the major arts organizations in the English-speaking world, used a system called Tessitura as their back end. So Tessitura is a... Is a uh, it's a consortium of arts organizations that produces some software. It's used all over the world. It's used in the, the Sydney Opera House uses it, the Melbourne Theatre Company uses it, and, and many other places. Uh, and so all transactions, user registration, ticket sales, inventory, performance data, seating charts, everything goes into Tessitura. So this website, uh, very simple on one hand, has to do some rather complex interaction with Tessitura on the back end. Um, Tessitura does have a web service APIs, but sometimes you have to write some custom store procedures. Um, and the project was kind of further complicated by the fact that the stakeholders in this case, it was, they were new to, to doing offshore development. So this, this was a risky uh, step, and they're quite nervous about taking their, their work offshore. They didn't know if they'd be able to have the level of communication and transparency that they were used to. So, so what did we do? Um, First of all, the, choose, the team chose the Ruby on Rails solution. Uh, the Rails platform worked really well for this team because they were able to start from scratch. Uh, there was some work required to adapt to the to the Tessitura web service calls uh, instead of using Active Record, which is a normal way to store data. But um, other than that, the, the platform worked quite well. Um, some of the Tessitura team was located in the U.S., so the, the customers, experts on Tessitura were located in the U.S., and the development team was located here in Pune. Um, but we set it up so the various members of the team rotated through the U.S. site, and, and it was noticed, things went just went noticeably smoother when the tech lead for Pune was present on site in Pittsburgh. Uh, a lot of the questions were able to be answered in a much more efficient way. Um, they used Git as the source control mechanism and actually hosted the source on GitHub. So GitHub uh, is out on the cloud. It doesn't really matter where you are in the world. Uh, and it basically removes location from the source control uh, equation altogether. So um, the developers can easily access the code, check it in, and the customer can pull the, the deployment scripts and the deployment uh, the, the code out of GitHub to go right into production. Um, one thing we did have to overcome was the latency of communicating with Tessitura. Is Tessitura isn't the kind of system we could just, you know, reinstall at our site in Pune. So all of the, the in the early parts of the project, things were very slow because demos and showcases and um, functional tests ran very slowly against the Tessitura system in the U.S. So the team built a very thin proxy layer that uh, mocked the Tessitura interfaces to cache the responses from Tessitura, so you only have to pay the latency penalty once. And this sped up development enormously. So the result of all this is, is a team that is now very mobile. Uh, at one point during the project, we actually moved the team to our New Delhi office, uh, and with very with no loss of productivity at all. You know, they because they're, they're, all of their requirements were so lightweight and location was so irrelevant to them, they were able to move around quite easily. In fact, at the postscript, there was a fire in, our, uh, in the building where our Delhi office is located last weekend. It wasn't serious, but it's going to be a couple of weeks before the team can move back in. 
and they're now operating out of a hotel suite. And, and again, there have been a few glitches, but for the most part, they just continue. Uh, you know, services that enable enable uh, people to book tickets online. And it interfaces with a lot of uh, third-party uh, services like payment services and actually talking to the uh, reservation systems, the government's uh, reservation systems, uh, uh, ticket booking systems, and uh, insurance systems, and a bunch of other uh, third-party systems to allow a complete uh, seamless uh, uh, you know, online ticketing experience. The challenge was, uh, so the project is about was about uh, taking and re-engineering an ASP com based application and uh, porting this to uh, porting this to uh, .NET. Uh, the project was running for several years. Uh, several years before we before uh, ThoughtWorks took it over and it went through several vendors, uh, and uh, which which actually built up upon a set of legacy code. And there was uh, there was uh, you know. Uh, ThoughtWorks was actually dealing with a with a code base uh, code base actually worked on by several vendors before before ThoughtWorks took it over. And one of the objectives that that ThoughtWorks was given was uh, to get or erase the legacy system by early 2010. And uh, we had a and there was a bunch of uh, a bunch of things that we wanted to wanted to deal with before before we actually got around gotten around to doing that. So we have a next slide where, where we've got some statistics, key statistics on the project. Uh, this shows you the number of bills uh, per day, the number of the team, and how it's scaled up. Uh, but let me talk, talk to you about some of the issues and challenges uh, that, that we faced uh, that we faced with this, uh, with this project. So first thing was we when we started we were uh, we, had, we had a set of five developers and uh, very very fast, very very quickly uh, this team of five. Uh, up to over 200, uh, a team of 200 uh, that was spread over three locations, uh, three locations in Pune, uh, Bangalore, uh, and the UK. There was the we already had a code base which had over one million lines of code uh, that we needed to needed to deal with, and this code base was uh, monolithic and very very difficult to work with. Uh, for making any changes to the system, we had to check out the whole code. Uh, even small changes introduced within the system could ca cause a feature to break uh, for someone else, and uh, it was hard to kind of, uh, kind of, kind, kind of introduce changes into, uh, into this code base. So what it, what it led to was like a huge number of failed builds, a uh, long, long build time. So it would take several hours to uh, run a, run a build initially. And uh, most of the times, most often than not, the the build would be broken. So you'd have uh, you would have fix, uh, people fixing builds uh, all the time rather than focusing on on features. The other one, uh, the other build was uh, that introduced by the distributed agile part of part of this was that we had teams distributed across locations, and uh, there was a there was a lack of consistency in the in the design and architecture of the of the platform. So. People were making well-intentioned changes. They were using uh, uh, they were using libraries that uh, they thought were useful, but uh, when it came to integrating all of this, we, we ran into several issues. So let me quickly move on to the next slide, which uh, talks of some of the solutions uh, uh, solutions we used. Uh, obviously, one of our one of our key points that we, we thought we would attack was a monolithic code base. Uh, we actually set up a team which we called the SWAT team. Um, and the objective of, of the SWAT team was to break this uh, monolithic code base and slice and dice it so that uh, it could be easily workable. We used a mantra uh, that we called, and that was to make all components and services within the application independently buildable, testable, and deployable. So with this, this basic principle in mind, we, uh, we, we worked on the monolithic code base uh, and uh, over a period of time, we, we split this into into several uh, independent uh, independent applications, uh, services, and and UI components. What really helped us with, with achieving this one goal was uh, we were quickly able to parallelize our build. Uh, we were able to move from we are earlier using Group Control .NET, which is an open source uh, uh, initiative, and we moved that to, to our uh, studio product, which is Cruise. Uh, this really helped us parallelize uh, our build. 
So now we could independently build a component without having to wait for the whole uh, whole application to be built. Uh, this was this was one uh, advantage we got from uh, got from doing this. Uh, it gave us early feedback. It helped us fix issues uh, and helped us uh, you know helped us in the whole whole build process. The other bit was uh, we used the virtualization a lot. Uh, we used virtualization to to actually set up a build farm. Uh, or a build grid. Uh, today it runs, I think, uh, close to 200 plus, uh, close to around maybe 250 uh, virtual machines uh, that are uh, basically primary user build machines that that run our base. Uh, that what has resulted as an impact. One of the impacts of that has been that our builds are now uh, happening under one hour, uh, which used to typically take take uh, several hours to to complete. The other bit was uh, major change that we introduced was. Uh, how we use soap services, how we, how we remodel uh, the way soap was used. We moved from an RPC model, based model to a document based model. And what it means is, A, like Scott said earlier, uh, our, uh, our services were modeled around business process. So payment became a process, uh, business process, and uh, was reflected as a service. Uh, similarly, a booking, uh, booking was a service uh, which, which also represented a, a business process. The objects or the request and response of these work of these services were modeled as uh, were modeled as business uh, documents. So these were documents uh, that a business analyst could read, say that hey, here's my here's my customer registration document, and uh, the service can read it. The service can work on that or uh, work on that. That that gave us a, gave us a couple of advantages over here. Uh, one of the advantages was that uh, all business holders and stakeholders really knew what what the services were delivering. B, uh, the services uh, were now easy to support. Uh, you know, it was easy for us to support multiple consumers of the services without by introducing new functionality for one consumer that did break the functionality for for another consumer. Uh, also, the whole a result of the whole process and a result of all these all the things that we need, uh, that we put uh, in place uh, allowed us to do uh, smaller. Uh, low risk releases as opposed to one bag, one big bang uh, high risk uh, release. The other innovation that that some of the developers use, uh, Scott talked about it a bit. Uh, we had we had we have several repositories uh, which which replicate. Uh, these are several SEM repositories as at each uh, location, uh, and they replicate uh, replicate the, uh, every check in that happens at the location. Uh, even after putting all these things in place, we still had a problem that uh, because of the number of developers working on the project, we got we have uh, a lot of broken builds, and that means that there are fewer opportunities for developers to check in code when there's a broken build. So uh, some of the developers actually came up with this idea of using Git, Git and Git SVN. That uh, so every developer had a Git repository on the local machines and they could do local check-ins. Uh, and when there was an opportunity available to to kind of push this uh, build into into the central uh, SVN repository, uh, they would just use Git SVN to push this uh, into the repository as the first available opportunity. That really helped us with the with the whole CI and the and the check-in check-in process uh, a great deal. Uh, produced a lot of uh, lot of developer pain. So let's look at what what results uh, we got and what what helped us uh, by by putting putting in all these. Uh, Things in place. We we hit the delivery on time. We had an online on-time delivery uh, early February this year. Uh, we were able to migrate from the whole whole legacy code base to a completely new platform, a re-engineered uh, re-engineered platform. We have used virtualization extensively over here as well, and that really helped us scale scale up our developer environments, our uh, our testing environments and our uh, and our uh, non perform you know non functional test environments as well. Uh, we've gotten to a point where we are we are making short of uh, uh, short of releases. We are releasing every every two weeks with a, with, a, with an objective of getting to continuous deployment. Uh, that would be several releases a day as opposed to one release every uh, every several weeks. Uh, and We've been able to achieve at, and get to this point because of the you know the clever combination of uh, being able to use one test deployment uh, along with test driven de uh, along with you know combined with test uh, driven uh, driven deployment. So 
I think that uh, it's back to Scott to for for the summary of our discussion today. Okay. So, I'll uh, just leave you with this thought that it is possible to distribute agile projects globally, but you can't do it without taking a holistic approach and paying attention to the people that you have on the team, the processes that you use, and the technology that uh, th that you use to implement and support the development of the project. And finally, it's communication that really ties everything together, and that, that is at the heart of Agile, and that doesn't change when you go distributed, and you have to do a lot of things differently to facilitate that communication. It turns out there's no single thing that makes this all work. There's no magic bullet. It's a combination of lots of little things, and it's applying the right technique, the right tool, to the right job in the right circumstances that really makes a difference. Um, and I suppose you've probably noticed by now that the practices we've talked about for offshore street development aren't limited there. I, they, many times we've developed these things, we've pushed the state of the art um, in uh, these big distributed projects, and then the techniques are fed back into co-located projects as well. So you may find application of some of these things definitely to your co-located projects as well. So um, with that, I thank you for your attention today. We're happy to take questions. If you want to type your questions into the Q&A uh, box there on your WebEx console, we'd be happy to discuss them. I think we've got a couple of minutes left for questions if, if you'd like to do that. Well, in the meantime, maybe uh, So we've got a, t a question about an enterprise architecture that requires. Uh, how do you uh, how do you deal with an enterprise architecture that requires ongoing certification? Do you want to take that, Rajesh? Okay. So this is this has been a very uh, common question. I think we've uh, we've had uh, at and so what what's uh, how do you how do you deal with enterprise architecture? How do you deal with? Uh, yeah, it's a topic that it comes up a lot, and uh, a lot, uh, and uh, it again comes boils down to the role of an architect and the role of, of an enterprise architect in in uh, building enterprise uh, solutions. So, so one of uh, one of the things and one of the uh, things I believe is really important for for an organization to have uh, from an enterprise architecture standpoint uh, is to be able to build a roadmap. Uh, for knowing what applications, uh, what uh, what are the applications that you need to put in place, uh, put in place. What is the what are the timelines for your for your new applications to to uh, uh, to be deployed? Uh, what's your roadmap for retiring old, older systems, uh, retiring legacy systems, and uh, and uh, extremely important is the question that a lot of architects and a lot of people people within legal people uh, and other functions are dealing with is how do you uh, how do you ensure compliance with certifications compliance with different regulatory compliance that are that are coming up along along the way and how do you build these into into your application requirements so so part of your roadmap to uh, to the application you build and deploy is would also be uh, how would how would your uh, certification or compliance requirements fit, uh, fit into your fit into the fit into your product requirements or your application requirements? And I, and I think that's uh, that's one key question that you need to answer. Uh, you need to figure out, uh, or you need to put in put in controls of, or you need to put in stories in place of where you need to actually building an application to to kind of. Uh, Sort of your certification or your or your compliance uh, requirements. Call anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's important to we we talk a lot internally about what constitutes an enterprise architect and if, if there's a role for them on agile projects. And I think it depends on what you call an architect. But if it's somebody who just writes standard documents and draws boxes and lines and never writes code or gets involved with the team, then that's probably not useful. I realize. You may have to deal with these people within your organization, but it pays to have somebody 
who you call an architect that sits with the team. I, I didn't talk about that in my technical leadership section, but uh, just for the sake of time. But the, the role of an architect on a distributed project becomes more important than on a co-located project because it's really important to maintain that technical vision. But it has to be the kind of person that's willing to sit down with the team, that's willing to get their hands dirty, and that's, that's willing to play a facilitative role instead of a prescriptive role. So uh, it's really important to involve the team. You can still have an architectural vision, you can still have a technology roadmap, and an enterprise, uh, an enterprise architecture that teams need to comply with, but let them let the team be involved in how they're going to comply. It's really important to, to specify the overall goals and allow the team to come up with the specific ways in which they want to they want to meet those goals, um, because they probably know better than anybody else how those requirements are going to influence the work that they have to do. Um, so we got a question here. Uh, uh, first of all, how important are development standards to distributed agile? And uh, what approach to standardization was there on a 200 person team? So, um, yeah, this is another question again that, that's come up uh, frequently. Um, so, what do you, so what do you want to do or what you don't want to do is, uh, is something that's really important to understand is uh, you want to understand the part of the system that you need to control. Uh, and that means, if, for example, uh, if you have common libraries that are that are being shared across the development team, uh, it's really it's really important to understand that these common libraries need uh, need a process for change. Uh, it's uh, they have to they have to work work across by with certain standards. Uh, whether whether these are whether these are coding standards or whether you want to keep it as loosely the thing as that these are the interfaces that these uh, shared components will get exposed or you know create an API kind of a structure around around, around your common component and this is probably the only only thing that I would uh, I would control on a distributed agile project. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the one other thing that I can think about is the use of common libraries. Uh, if you're using dependency injection libraries or, or any common components uh, across the distributed teams, you don't want uh, one team to kind of, kind of use uh, one set of libraries uh, or, or even different versions of this, uh, you know, of, of, of a same library. So that's another point I would I would like like to keep a uh, strong, you know, uh, that that probably needs uh, some control around. We spoke about domain objects, and and here's where. Uh, then you really do not want to enforce any kind of uh, standards around around how domain objects are controlled. Uh, I would here is where there's an anti-pattern. So rather than rather than uh, keeping a strong uh, strong control over domain objects, I would let their teams uh, teams build their own domain objects within their own systems and uh, not not share these across uh, across uh, you know not not share these uh, these these kind of let teams. Uh, Work in a in a, a decoupled manner, rather than uh, the moment you start enforcing uh, controls around around, uh, around such things like common libraries or uh, sorry uh, common code and domain objects, uh, you start actually building uh, building dependency and and coupling between your teams, preventing them you know the freedom of uh, building their own stuff and doing the building uses at their own pace. So that's 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 my view on on coding standards. And we'll also try to implement uh, the automatic checks in the build as well. So using things like check style for, for Java or um, there's others. There's a number of, of uh, things for Ruby that you can use. So um, it, that ensures as part of the build process that the code adheres to a certain minimal set of standards. Absolutely. Yeah. We're also looking at uh, – we're also – Getting, doing more and more visualization of code quality, so um, being able to run visualizations to show over time various various features of the code, various metrics derived from the code, you know, various you know kind of coupling uh, dependencies, structure of the code, uh, complexity, things like that, kind of that over time. I think we're probably out of time. We've gone over a bit as well. Uh, Gautam, do you do you want to have any closing remarks you want to make? I know there was a question about will the will the uh, presentation be available 
I think we'll be sending out a link soon with the with the, this put up on the web 